Ocrevus became the first approved therapy for primary progressive multiple sclerosis after it was proven to reduce disability progression in a two-year randomized study. But does it work in the long run? Today we're going to look at a 6.5-year extension study of the original Oratorio study and see does it retain its efficacy, what are the side effects, does it reduce brain atrophy, and most importantly, does it cause cancer? Let's have some fun. Now, if you want to learn more about Ocrevus in general, I have a separate introductory video on this topic, but very briefly, Ocrevus is a medication given through the IV for multiple sclerosis once every six months, and the way it works is by killing a certain type of white blood cells called the B lymphocytes. And these are the cells in the immune system that make antibodies, and it turns out they're very important in generating inflammation in multiple sclerosis. The main side effects of Ocrevus are that it can cause infusion reactions such as rash or hives during the infusion, and it can weaken the immune system. Not the entire immune system, it just takes out this one type of cell, but some people do have an increased rate of infections, and it has been associated with an increased rate of hospitalization with COVID-19. Now, I don't have any specific financial conflict of interest, although I am a longtime proponent of the very similar drug rituximab, although my general opinion is that Drugs in this class that work on B cells, including Ocrevus, Rituximab, and Ofatumumab, also known as Kisimta, are all very similar, and it's unlikely one is significantly better than another. And by the way, my name is Brandon Bieber. I make videos about multiple sclerosis every Wednesday, so please subscribe and ring the bell for notifications. And if you find this video informative, please click like. So the Oratorio trial was a randomized, double-blind, controlled trial in primary progressive multiple sclerosis, and they recruited 732 people and there was two-to-one randomization, meaning that two-thirds of the people got Ocrevus and one-third got placebo. And they did this to recruit people into the trial since they knew they would have a higher than 50% chance to actually get the active drug. And the dose of Ocrevus was 600 milligrams IV every 24 weeks or six months. And the first dose was given 300 milligrams twice in two separate infusions two weeks apart because you have the greatest risk of an infusion reaction with the very first infusion. So they had 488 in the Ocrevus group versus 244 in the placebo group, and 74% of these people completed the randomized trial after about two years. So what we're going to look at today is the open label extension. So after the drug was proven to be effective, everyone in the original randomized trial was given the opportunity to be given Ocrevus. Open label, they knew they were getting the active drug. So we're looking at a comparison between people who started Ocrevus right away versus people who got placebo for two years and then change to Ocrevus and see if there's a difference. And so 72% of people entered the open label extension and 74% of those people or 388 people reached open label extension week 144. In other words, completed a decent proportion of the open label extension trial. So a little over half of those in the original randomized trial actually gave us real data. Now it's really hard to retain patients in these long-term trials because people move and people are often driving long distances and they may have significant disabilities, making it very difficult for them to do the research. So this is really typical of long-term open label extension studies, but it does bring into question the quality of the data since a lot of people dropped out and there could be some biases in terms of who drops out and who stays in the study. Nonetheless, I would consider this study to have a fairly good methodology and you can see a diagram of the overall nature of the study here. This is the randomized phase where you can see Ocrevus 300 milligrams two weeks apart versus placebo just giving saline through the IV. And this is the open label extension phase where where everyone was getting Ocrevus, and you can see the MRI scans and the doses of Ocrevus. And we're looking at here the 6.5 year mark, but this study will continue through 2022 and we may get more data. I can also show some of the characteristics of the patients in this study. The average age was 44.6, about half were female and half were male, which is definitely different from the overall nature of multiple sclerosis. About 75% of people with MS are women, but in primary progressive multiple sclerosis, sclerosis, it's a little bit closer to a one-to-one -one ratio. The average EDSS, or Expanded Disability Status Score, which is a measure
measure of disability in MS used in clinical trials was 4.7. I have a separate video on EDSS if you want to take a look. 4.5 is the late level of disability where someone could walk 300 meters. So most of these people had moderate disability. They had some limitation of their mobility, but they were still walking. In fact, to get into the trial, you had to not be using an assistive device. In other words, you had to have an EDSS of 5.5 or lower. And it's very unlikely to get diagnosed with primary progressive multiple sclerosis if you have very low disability, such as 2.0 or less. Another thing to note is that a lot of these people had active lesions. So 27% had gadolinium enhancing or active lesions, which is relatively high for primary progressive multiple sclerosis. So you could say as a group, these people were somewhat young and inflammatory overall. It's hard to know if these results could be applied to an older group of patients who were less likely to have active lesions. So let's take a look at the results. And what you'll see is that those originally randomized to Ocrevus did better even 6.5 years later. So the first thing we'll look at is disability progression. So we're looking at the percentage of people who had worsening of the EDSS, again, the expanded disability status scale used to measure disability in MS. And they looked at people who worsened by at least one point or by 0.5 points if they had an EDSS of 5.5 or greater. And it had to be be confirmed by a subsequent exam 24 weeks or six months later. So this wasn't just like fluctuations in disability or relapses. They really wanted to look at people who actually got worse. And you can see the blue line, the Ocrevus group, people who were originally randomized to Ocrevus versus those who initially got placebo and then later got Ocrevus. And even all of these weeks later, 6.5 years later, there was a difference. And the people who originally got Ocrevus were 28% less likely to have disability progression. They also looked at some other specific markers of disability. So what you're looking at is the nine hole peg test, which is a test of hand dexterity where you have to take little pegs and put them into holes as quickly as possible. And you can see that those who originally got Ocrevus, the blue line, were 35% less likely to have a worsening of their time on the nine hole peg test by 20% or more. And they also looked at walking speed by the time 25 foot walk which is simply how quickly you can walk 25 feet. And they looked at how many people progressed in other words, worsened in their walking speed by 20% or more. And 23% fewer people who were originally randomized to Ocrevus had worsening of their walking speed over the 6.5 years. And they also looked at composite disability, the proportion who worsened either by EDSS or nine hole peg test or 25 foot walk. And there was a 27% reduction in the probability of composite disability progression in those who originally originally got Ocrevus even after the 6.5 year marker. In other words, people who got Ocrevus later on didn't catch up. They were still behind by the end of the study. And perhaps the most impressive result is that those who got Ocrevus the whole time had a lower chance of requiring a wheelchair. In this graph, the authors looked at the percentage of people who reached EDSS 7, which is the level of disability where a wheelchair is required for distances longer than 5 meters. And you can see that those who got Ocrevus in the original randomization trial had a 42% lower chance of requiring a wheelchair. I should note that there's an error on this graph. It looks like the placebo group had a 70% chance of requiring a wheelchair. This is a mistake. It's actually 18.9% after 6.5 years in the original placebo group who got Ocrevus after two years versus 11.5% in the treatment group. I have in fact emailed the authors about this error. The data on MRI scans also look very impressive. Here we're looking at T1 gadolinium enhancing lesions, which are active lesions that take up the contrast dye because there's a temporary breakdown of the blood-brain barrier. And you can see during the randomized portion of the trial, Ocrevus is in blue and placebo is in gray. And obviously Ocrevus was much better at preventing these lesions. And once everyone was on Ocrevus in the extension phase, there were virtually no active lesions. The same story was true for new or enlarging T2 lesions. You can see that placebo was much worse than Ocrevus. And you can see the mixed color is the group that was changed to Ocrevus later on. And interestingly, they still had a little bit more lesions than those who got Ocrevus the whole time, 
suggesting that there's a little bit of a therapeutic lag, and that number sort of went down over time, and by the end of the trial, both groups had virtually no lesions. Now, in terms of brain atrophy, the results were somewhat disappointing, as the Ocrevus group, the group of people who originally got Ocrevus, did not have less brain atrophy than those who got it later. As you can see in the blue line, there was a slight trend towards the group randomized to Ocrevus having less brain atrophy, but it was not a statistically significant difference, and both groups had a decrease on average about 3% of brain volume over the period of the study. Next, we'll turn to the side effects. So one of the concerns with these medications, Ocrevus, Rituximab, and Kisimta, is that if you take them for a prolonged period of time, you could get low levels of immunoglobins. So generally speaking, even though we're depleting the cells that make antibodies, the levels of antibodies in the blood are actually at normal levels, at least in the short run. And the reason for that is one, the proteins have a long half-life, so they stick around for a long time. And also B cells can turn into these larger cells called plasma cells that don't have the CD20 receptor and are hence immune to all three of these drugs. All of these drugs work on the same receptor. So this is looking at the levels of immunoglobins after the 6.5 years. And the concern is that if you can't regenerate your plasma cells, even if you don't have low levels of immunoglobins in the short run, you can have low levels of immunoglobins in the long run, which could make you more susceptible to infections. And so this is looking at the percentage of people who had immunoglobin levels below the lower limit of normal throughout the 6.5 years. Now, for immunoglobin M, which are short-term antibodies, the rate was pretty high, about 29%. However, these are not as important and not as strongly associated with the risk of infections. Immunoglobin G, or long-term immunity, only 5% had rates below the lower limit of normal. So this is pretty favorable in my view. And by the way, many doctors would advocate holding these medications if the immunoglobin counts are low due to the risk of infections. Now, if we look at the actual risks of side effects, I'm not going to go over every single type of side effect, but the rate of infusion reactions was about 22% per year, which is similar to what has been previously reported. Serious infections were about 4% per year. Now, with cancer, there's a concern here. So in the patients who were originally randomized to Ocrevus, it was 0.93% per year rate of cancers versus only 0.27% per year in those who originally got placebo. And if we look at the individual cancers, we can see there were 24 cancers reported in those who originally got placebo. Now, for those who don't know, this is an old story. In the other randomized trials for Ocrevus, such as the OPERA study against Rebif, there were more cases of breast cancer in those who got Ocrevus, but it was not really known if it was just a chance effect, and the rate of breast cancers wasn't that high. It was actually pretty similar to just the general population. And you can see various different cancers, including four cases of breast cancer. There were 10 cases of basal cell skin cancer, which is a mild condition that's usually easily curable. So you could throw away these, but most of these other cancers are quite serious and potentially life-threatening. Compare that to only four cancers reported in those who originally got placebo. Now, again, this is two to one randomization, but there's a six-fold difference in the rate of cancers. So there are three times more cancers than expected relative to the placebo group. So there's one case of breast cancer, one individual got both metastatic pancreatic cancer and breast cancer, and one person had the relatively benign basal cell skin cancer. So there's a possible link between Ocrevus and long-term risk of cancer, although it's not 100% clear and I don't know if the 24 cancers is more than you would expect in the general population in that age group. So overall, I think the long-term data on Ocrevus looks pretty good, particularly the decreased use of wheelchairs in people who originally got the drug and were taking it the entire 6.5 years, although it has to be noted that the benefit is relatively modest, and many people with primary progressive MS taking Ocrevus do progress at least somewhat over many years. I think the safety data look pretty good except for the possible association with cancer and I'm not sure if we'll ever get a definitive answer on this but it is something to be concerned about. I'd love to know if you have any questions about this research or if you've taken Ocrevus I'd love to know your own experiences and side effects in the comments below and please let me know if you have any suggestions for future videos.